Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our Horde Ferryman monthly webinar series. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an editor for Horde Ferryman magazine. I am honored to be hosting this show today, which will focus on feed. Feed costs represent over half of the total cost of producing milk. With high fertilizer, corn, and soybean meal prices, dairy farmers will experience a squeeze on profitability this year. Higher milk prices will help, but our webinar today will focus on 10 areas to control or fine tune feed costs without sacrificing profitability. Our sponsor for today is Kuhn, and we thank them for their support of this program. If you're listening to the presentation live, you have access to a PDF printout of the handouts. You'll find that in the handout section of the, um, of the GoToWebinar control panel. Go down to the handout section and you can click on that link and print out a PDF. That document also contains some information about Kuhn, who once again is our sponsor for today's program. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will answer them following the presentation. Now, today, we welcome back a friend and familiar voice to our webinar series. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Mike Hutchins, a professor emeritus at the University of Illinois. Dr. Hutchins grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin and attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison to further his education. Since 1979, he has been an extension dairy specialist in the animal sciences department at the University of Illinois. Mike is extremely active in the dairy industry, particularly in the area of feeding and nutrition, and he has given presentations and taught dairy farmers all around the world. Our editorial team at Hordes Dairyman is so honored to work with him on books, articles and these webinars. So Mike, welcome back to the webinar series and look forward to hearing from you on your presentation today titled Feed Costs, 10 Opportunities for Savings. Well, thank you very much, Abby. And uh, we are excited to be back uh, on, on the webinar series here. And uh, with your foresight, uh, the timing could probably be much better because it is really the hot ticket item, at least uh, phone calls and emails that I get across my desk. And that is, what about these feed costs? So let's get on with our program and we'll be off and running. And as this slide says, things are changing. In fact, uh, the, the, there's changes so quickly that we really can't keep up with the PowerPoints to keep the most current feed prices on, uh, on there. And this will continue probably well into the growing season, which will have a huge impact as well. So today's program, we're gonna look at a couple aspects. First, look at some economic definitions and status of what, what's happening in the feed area. Then kind of look at the, the, the increasing feed costs and what are some of the alternatives and we're gonna give you 10 of them. And then finally, we're gonna also say, but what's really important, I think, is that we don't give up on milk yield and milk components because that's the other half of the profit equation. And that is, can we keep our milk price ahead of some of our increasing costs? So certainly our challenge is going to be higher feed costs. Uh, we have now seen feed costs go from 10 to 15 cents per pound of dry matter. That's huge. Uh, if you think about an average cow eating 50 pounds of dry matter. And in, in fact, right now it's over 16 cents right now here in Illinois. So you can see it represents a significant increase as well. Then not only that, but certainly some of our input costs for growing our forages are also going to go up. Uh, fertilizer prices have doubled and tripled in some situations there. Fuel costs continue to increase uh, here in the future, and certainly we are now looking at these prices, and we'll update these prices a bit later here in the presentation. So certainly, dairy farmers, uh, nutritionists, consultants, uh, veterinarians, big challenges here on the feed end of the equation. But there are opportunities as well. Uh, certainly, milk prices are at record high. Uh, the USDA had indicated probably going to be looking at a $23 all-milk average for 2022. Uh, and then we'll add our components to that. We have Jersey herds here in Illinois that are getting well in excess of $33 underweight for their milk. Certainly farmers can manage um, the part of this diet in terms of forage quality and quantity they have on the farm. And then other things they may also be raising on the farm even though they are gonna be more expensive this year. Milk components, especially milk fat are really valuable. And we can really build our milk check based on that milk fat, milk protein, and other solids as well. And of course, we have the new tool, and that's the new NASM, the new name for the dairy NRC, which came out in December of 21, and that allows us to do some fine tuning, especially on energy dynamics, uh, protein rates of passage, and those factors as well. So we got some interesting tools, as we would say, as well. 
I thought you did not define something. This uh, came out uh, back uh, last fall, and I have not seen a newer one, but this uh, budget uh, factors and that came out, and uh, they do a survey. These are from all across the United States, primarily big herds, 3,000 cows. The average milk yield were 83 pounds per cow, 181 days in milk. And I think, listeners, that's a really important number because when that gets over 200 days in milk, I will almost bet you a piece of pie that you're going to see milk yields going down. So there was your milk income. And there's another important number right at the bottom. And the break-even price on these whole sets of farms was 79 pounds of milk. Do you know that number? You know, especially in this dynamic times as feed prices are going up, uh, what is the break-even price? When and what is that break-even point to cull the cow? We've seen numbers like 45 to 48 pounds of milk is when she no longer is making you any money on your dairy farm. How do they break down? Well, as Abby points out, you probably want to print off because uh, we're going to be motoring right through this presentation today. As you know, I can talk modestly fast, so some of my foreign people are not happy with me, but I'll try to slow down just a little bit. But there you can see that feed cost sitting up there at 928, and that was from that last slide. Uh, basically, the cow expense, basically that's going to be your heifer expenses here, labor, milk calling, and they had several more, but I thought I'd put the top six. And of course, you uh, don't have a lot of control over such things as uh, labor costs, milk hauling, uh, health in some respects you might, and depending on your program. And, and also, you, you, one thing is you do control feed costs somewhat on your farms. So certainly this has also gone up. This is another group that I'm gonna, I, I get uh, emails from. Then we can just see uh, fuel prices are up. So that means your costs of raising forages are gonna go up and harvesting those forages along with equipment, trucks, and labor. So certainly, and of course, some states now, <clears throat> I believe California and New York are looking at 40 hour work weeks at this point. And of course, a number of states have minimum wages. And so that really starts to impact our dairy farmers as well. I got this slide from uh, Mike Rankin. Uh, it was in the November Hordes webinar and he just listed Remember, this was in uh, October, November, but you can see the yellow columns. All those numbers have gone up at this point. And I just saw yesterday across my desk, urea was over $8,000 a ton. So certainly <clears throat> those input costs have continued to increase. And that's another question that has to be bore in terms of looking at these feed cost strategies. So as Abby already points out that feed costs represent over 50%. This is a pie diagram that uh, kind of shows that at 55%. With today's price, that may be even closer to 60% here. And two things I would like to challenge my listeners. Number one, a farmer told me this two years ago, and he said, Mike, if I make a D decision, a feed decision, show me the money. And he said, if I'm going to make a change, if I'm going to go to a different hybrid of corn silage or a, a, a different type of byproduct feed or increase uh, amino acids in the ration, Show me what kind of potential I have in terms of returning profitability. And the other one I really stress, and that is the only reason that you dairy farmers are online today is you're a dairy farmer because you can take your crop inputs and add profits to them. We call that value added. And there are some farmers probably in the Midwest here in which they probably should sell their corn at 750 a bushel rather than put it through average to low producing dairy cows because the profitability, the value added will not be there. Well, this gets updated. Um, I've um, updated it several times. I think I'm close on the corn price. Some of us old people, I'm one of those people, I can remember when we get corn below $3 a bushel and we're, uh, and the crop guys are really happy to have you buy it. Now we're looking at $7.62 a bushel. So it, it, uh, it, it, it's really gone up in price. And uh, the little error said it was over $6. I just can't keep up with all these prices. The next one is soybean meal. And uh, depending where you are, uh, that price can be anywhere from uh, 460 to $500 plus a ton for 48 soy. I can remember $300 a ton. And a year and a half ago, one of my dairymen was really happy because he locked her in and then it took off on price. And of course, uh, Mike Rankin points out that hay is going to remain relatively high because in some cases, uh, fertilizer and also because of fuel costs associated with that. And of course, the bad news, byproducts go with that. Again, Mike Rankin put this slide together showing you how that price has changed over the last four years. And of course, it uh, continues to snake up there 
And of course, it's important for those of you that are in the, the dairy program, because now alfalfa prices is not an average alfalfa price, but it's a price supreme and, and, uh, and premium quality hay. So this table has some real, uh, a real uh, impact as far as that goes. I know many of you are saying, well, that program I didn't get paid for since late in December and then the rest of 2022. And the answer is that's good news because it means your insurance policy is not kicking in because of the good spread on milk price versus feed price. Well, we'll look at these changing milk prices uh, for many of us here in the Midwest and many markets in the United States, we are paid on pounds of fat and pounds of protein. And you can see if you go to the right side, you can see back in September of 2021, where our milk prices were at, where the, and there you can see at that time, protein was higher than fat. And, and so I think this is an interesting argument always, which component is going to be most valuable. I think you really want to feature, focus on both of them. But to me in the future, milk protein is going to be important because people around the world are going to want animal protein. And of course, uh, milk is an excellent source. Here's February of 2022. Uh, March, uh, Abby helped me out on this one a little bit. Uh, that one just came out just before uh, I put these um, the PowerPoints were in. And now you can see on March, milk fat is up to three dollars and ten cents a pound, and proteins is at two seventy two. So suddenly, should say suddenly, but you see they flip. But now they're getting back close together compared to February. So it's a very dynamic one. Besides the changing milk prices. Uh, on uh, several states have milk quotas. We are one of them in Illinois and supply management programs are here in place as well because processing plants just cannot absorb any more milk in some of the key areas, but there are some new plants being built as well. So one strategy before we get to our 10 tips, and, and that is that remember, we only get to set peak milk once in the lactation curve. And that question came in a couple of weeks ago. It did basically, uh, um, mature cows are going to peak somewhere around 40 to 60 days in milk. Older heifers around 90 to 100 days is pretty typical. And that is not fat corrected milk that or energy corrected milk that is just total milk yield. But that becomes critical because that sets the, the, the tenor of how much milk you're going to get during that whole lactation there. Number two, we know that high producing cows are the most efficient as you'll see in a minute and are the most profitable. And finally, I, I never want to give up milk. And that is because if a pound of dry matter is 15 cents, or you can change that to 16 if you wish. But certainly we know milk prices, uh, I got 22 cents plugged in here. Maybe you want to plug in 23 here. But using my numbers here of 23, 22 cents for milk, 15 cents for dry matter. Remember the guideline, one pound of dry matter will support roughly two pounds of milk, depending on milk components. So that has a value of 44 cents. And if I take off my feed cost, for every one pound of dry matter that I can get into my high producing cows, I should get a net profit of nearly 30 cents a cow a day. That is big, big numbers. And so those of you that are going to underfeed cows, cut back, and we've got dairymen doing that. I think they're really gonna violate all three of these rules listed here under milk production strategies. So what are we looking at in 2022? According to the USDA, they're predicting all milk price of $23 per hundred weight, but wild cards. We, I call them wild cards. Certainly we know that cow numbers are down, but generally the question is what will some states do, some dairymen do in terms of higher milk prices? Uh, will they actually increase cow numbers? We're down significant number of cows. Milk yield has slowed down because of the cow numbers and a higher feed cost. And so normally we expect to see you know, a 2% increase in milk. Well, it was 0.7 in this last year. What about this exports? Uh, we're exporting now rightfully about 17.5%. One of every six bulk tank of milks that's on the road that go to processing plants are gonna leave the United States. And then Mark Stevenson used this term black swan risk. It says, Dairyman, there's not much you can do about it. And now we are now seeing the new COVID-19 variant shutting down Shanghai, uh, shutting down Philadelphia, uh, impacting uh, Europe at this point. What will that do to the price of milk and movement of dairy products in the export event? And then of course, we're all well aware of the Ukraine-Russian war. And what impact is that going to have on fuel prices, fertilizer prices, uh, exports? We, we know that both of those countries export 
huge amounts of wheat and significant amounts of corn, sunflower uh, as seed or sunflowers as well. So certainly that's going to be a factor as well. And that's the beauty, I think, for those of you that signed up, especially uh, all of you that signed up for the Dairy Marginal Program, because if the, if the black swan event occurs, meaning something that you cannot predict, control, then you've got, so you've got some type of an insurance to undergird uh, your dairy farm. Well, here we go. Hang on to your hats. We've got 30 minutes, so uh, we're going to go. We're going to give you 10 ideas. Notice that big orange eye. So those of you that are Big Ten fans, we're going to test you to see how smart you are. I'll give you a clue. That big uh, orange eye stands for Illinois. So write that down on your piece of paper. So not only do you have to listen, but you have to kind of tickle your fancy as you'll see these other nine points pop up here. I, I think it's critical. You got to really know what are your feed costs are going to be. And with that, Abby is going to read you the first uh, survey uh, polling question. Yes, this is your chance to participate. So if you would, please take a look at this question and pick the answer that best matches your position. How much has your feed cost per cow increased from 2020 to 2022? Um, select one of the following. Um, up $1 per cow per day. Up $2.50 per cow per day. Up $3.50 per cow per day. Or I do not know. So please take... Um, a moment, answer the question, pick one of those choices. We have good participation from our audience. And also remember, um, Dr. Hutchins said he has that other game going on where you can also guess what university um, he is talking about with each of his points. So don't forget about that. Let's close the poll here. And Dr. Hutchins, I'll just read through the results quickly. Um, up $1 per cow per day was 11%. Up 250 per cow per day was 54%. Up 350 per cow per day was 15%. And I do not know was 19%. Well, Abby, th thanks very much for reading those numbers to me. Uh, I, I guess uh, I'm not sure there is a right answer. I, I wonder when you go $1 per cow per day, remember we're looking at all costs and that includes putting forages in at market price. And the Dave Fisher years ago showed us data that I could raise corn silage for $22 a ton and alfalfa hay for $90 a ton. And obviously, uh, if you're putting, you're kind of cheating the system a little bit if you're putting them in at cost of production. And then that 19% that don't know, that's, that's really pretty scary because how can you and I manage our costs if we really don't know where we're at? So thanks very much. Let's go ahead and move on. I got this grid and I updated this uh, as quickly as I have, and it's probably two weeks old, if you can believe that. But I said, what does it cost to feed cows in Illinois? And I know we have people from around the world here. And so the, you want, you probably want to do yours in kilograms, miners in pounds. But you can see my forage is going to cost me about $3 per cow per day, a significant cost. Uh, corn grain, that is corn grain. By the way, that forage cost. Just so you're aware, I'm using two thirds of the dry matter from corn silage and one third from alfalfa, which means I am actually lowballing that cost a little bit because as I feed less corn silage, that cost is going to go up. The energy cost is corn byproduct feeds. You can see that's going to that's a mixture of half fuzzy cotton seed. I love the oil and half corn gluten feed, and you'll see why a bit later because it's a good feed price. The protein supplement is going to be about a buck per cow per day, and that's half distillers grains and half 48 soy. And so uh, again, I, some of you that are not using distillers grains, your number will be higher. And the mineral vitamin additive price, I've got a dollar 20. That is uh, can quite variable depending on the levels of feed abs you're adding here. That 10 cents I think is gonna be really important. And maybe that's too low, but I'm saying, I wanna be sure someone, that could be you, the dairy farmer, it could be your daughter, who's got computer skills, it could be your nutritionist, someone has to sit down and build these rations. So my cost is $8.60 a cow, and that's gonna require about 49 pounds of dry matter going into my cow. Now here comes what I call the big four. Now, now you can see there's that same $8.16, but now I divide that by 49 pounds of dry matter, and there is my 16 cents plus. I rounded it off to 16 cents. I can remember when it sat there at a dime or 11 cents for several years in a row. So what does that cost per pound of dry matter? You need to know that. 
And that'll depend again, as you saw from my examples, your sources of feed ingredients. The next one is, what does it cost to produce 100 pounds of milk? And, and this is with 80 pound milk average. There's another important point. Take a look, 80 pounds in the green, 70 pounds in the red. So now those people who are cutting back, we're just going to spend less money on feed costs because uh, I don't wanna pay uh, the expenses there. Look what happens to cost per hundred weight of milk. From 1020, it goes up to 1166. So not, I didn't save anything. In fact, if anything, uh, my, my feed costs went up because my milk yield went down. Income more feed costs, uh, you can see it goes that same direction. Uh, we probably need about $11 to cover all our costs here in Illinois. And of course now with fuel and, and, uh, and labor costs, and fertilizer costs, all those things. Of course, fertilizer will be reflected in feed costs, but certainly some of those other variable costs jump in there as well. And of course, it has nothing to do with feed costs and that is feed efficiency. And that is the pounds of milk per pound of dry matter. And again, you can see by dropping 10 pounds of milk, my feed efficiency went from 1.63 to 1.4. So certainly powerful data. You know, that's the only thing you get out of my webinar is you're gonna sit down this tonight, this weekend, whenever, and I'm going to do my, my balance, my grid as I call it, to see where I'm at. Point number two, I've got a red W. So I won't badger you much about this, but this one is going to be feed efficiency as a tool. And you knew this was coming. I'm a big believer in feed efficiency because it is a powerful tool because it allows you to ask the question, is the relationship between dry matter intake and milk yield, fat corrected or energy corrected, optimal for my dairy farm? Number two, if I got groups of cows on the farm, they will have different feed efficiencies. Trust me, a heifer group, will have a different feed efficiency than, 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 than a cow group. Early lactation versus late lactation. And then the third one, and you're saying, okay, Mike, I think I'm gonna make a change. Well, will the feed efficiency pick it up? I'm gonna increase the amount of rumen undegraded protein. I am going to look at a different corn hybrid. Will that change, management change or feed ingredient change measure in terms of feed efficiency? Again, this goes quickly. These are numbers, uh, feed efficiency, there are definitions. And notice on the up line, uh, top line is pounds of dry matter in red. That means feed refusals are not counted against the cow. Uh, that will show up in your feed cost in, a, in another category. Here are numbers you can see listed that we use as guidelines here. And there's an example listed that you can work through as well. Most of you have seen this before. I want to share with you this nice PowerPoint from The Ohio State University. Dr. Norman St. Pierre actually uh, presented this several years ago. And so uh, there is pounds of milk and kilograms for my European colleagues and, the, and some of the other people around the world. And now you can see how feed efficiency changes when I have uh, 25 kilos or 55 pounds of milk. I go down to a really good herd, 90 pounds of milk. You can see uh, that's going to have a feed efficiency 1.63. And a lot of you here online today, you'd say, where's the 100 pound cow? And I extrapolate that out. You're probably gonna be looking at closer to about a 1.7. And this is the entire herd. This is the entire herd. The other beauty of this is, let's say your high herd, uh, high group cows are averaging 85 pounds of milk and your low strain cows are averaging 60. Now you've got the numbers. You can compare them back and forth at this point. And of course, remember what I said earlier, show me the money. Well, here we are. I'm gonna take that 70 pound average cow, probably not even an average cow anymore in the United States, uh, but uh, our, our national average is around 23,000 pounds of milk. There's that 16 cents per pound of dry matter. And so if I can go from a feed efficiency of 1.3 to 1.4 and keep that same amount of milk, now that's gonna be a winner. That means I got four pounds less dry matter. I have just made 64 cents more per cow per day. Ask me, ask me if that is not a big number. Most of my herds in Illinois are gonna be in that next category, 1.4 to 1.5. And again, you can see there's another 54 cents there as well. So certainly this feed efficiency has a real economic impact out there on farms. Number three, another M for you, those of you that are playing the, the big 10 game with me, write her down, evaluating feed costs and feed ingredients. And this is run by a colleague of mine, 
every uh, two weeks. This is Sesame, that is the free program from The Ohio State University. And this is April, actually it was May, uh, uh, March 31, April uh, 20, uh, 22 prices. And you've got feed of ingredients listed on the left side. Currently, that is the price that that individual found in the Midwest area. So that would be kind of like Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota prices. And then on the right is break even. So it says, well, what is that really worth if we rack up all the 30 different feeds or 25, whatever you have in your, your listing, and how, how, do they, how does that feed compete? So on corn, it says currently corn is $226 a ton. That's pretty close to $7 a bushel. And it says that break evens at 20, 200. So it says, you're not stealing corn. Uh, you're saying, you got that right, Mike. I'm not stealing corn at, at that price. But now you can see on any all the red values coming down here uh, that are not good, good buys. A lot of farmers look at canola as an alternative. And the problem that we have seen is that the canola prices are modestly high because of the drought we saw in the Canadian Plain States, or Prairie States, I guess I would call it, or Plain States up there as well. And so uh, remember, this is all adjusted for, these prices are based on amino acids, lysine, methionine, energy, uh, and those uh, considerations as well. Alfalfa hay is pretty much a break even. That's why it's still in black. Pork, meat, and bone meal, you can see, is in the green. It, it's a good buy. And of course, some people, some feed companies just don't support that. Here are the ones you really want to look at, the green ones. You can see the corn byproducts. They continue to inch up. Uh, I can remember back when distillers grains were 160 a ton and gluten was $100 a ton. Anyway, they're still in the green, and that's why I have those in my feeding programs, because I can feed them cheaper when I put those in there. Soy holes and fuzzy cotton seed does not. Uh, check out here, although next year might be a better deal. Cotton acreages in West Texas specifically are going to go up 9%. So we're going to have a lot more cotton seed available next year if planting intentions are correct. Wheat mids, you can see uh, pretty much uh, almost that one can almost be in black, pretty much a break even as far as that goes. Well, Abby, I thought I would also look at, uh, he also uh, runs these numbers or they run these numbers for me. And here are those same feedstuffs, but looking at regional comparisons. So we got Midwest, West, Northeast. They did Southwest as well, Southeast. Uh, how many numbers do you really want? But you can see here that these are not constant. So you can see we in the Midwest do quite well. We've got uh, the best uh, uh, soybean meal and corn prices. You can see uh, the Northeast uh, do better on corn gluten feed. That surprised me a little bit, but they do better. Obviously the people out West really get hammered because a lot of this is transportation because they're not in a in the, the growing areas like the, the I states are here, Pennsylvania, New York states and stuff like that. So that's another interesting comparison as well. Uh, these are very fluid type numbers. Let's go to number four. And, and, and that's really a, a bird, that's a Hawkeye. If some of you are wondering uh, what that is up there. Let's look at forage quality very quickly. And these are my two numbers. I think uh, I would challenge you to hopefully get forage digestibility, NDF digestibilities in legumes and grasses over 50% and corn silage is over 60%. In some cases that could be a real challenge because that allows me to determine how much energy I'm gonna get from those forages. And that's gonna be one of your solutions. It is going to be feeding perhaps less expensive forage inputs. But remember these fuel costs are gonna come into play here in the future as well. There are other countries online here in which forages are very expensive. They're importing, uh, for example, alfalfa from the United States into China and Japan and South Korea. So uh, may not be a good alternative. Another one is looking at the rate of feed passage. And the, and the tool I'm gonna use is UNDF, undigestible nutrient detergent fiber. And that number is fairly soft uh, in terms of where it should be, but uh, you can have your computers calculate this number for you. I'm targeting for a Holstein cows, somewhere around 5.3 pounds or less than that there. So if, if the UNDF gets a bit high, then this, this thumb rule is gonna force you, I think, I suggest to feed less of that forage or get it out of the ration or dilute it out because that's gonna dictate rate of passage and fill capacity, which is really important in early lactation high producing cows. Uh, this PowerPoint uh, comes from Dairyland Labs, 
and it's based on some 140,000, 141,000 samples. And you can see the inherent percent of samples. And there's that world famous bell shaped curve. And you can see on the left is alfalfa in the green, on the right and the brown is going to be your corn silages. The best curve, if you want to look at NDF digestibility at 30 hours, is going to be the BMR low lignin corn silage. And so some of you I know are planting the low reduced lignin alfalfa that will shift that curve more to the right. And that's the direction you want to go here. Uh, you'll notice also that we've got our, our uh, small grains. So that'll be some of your cover crops. And a lot of interest in cover crops now. But look at the look at the, the, the flatness of that curve, which means some of these small grain cover crops, uh, uh, rye, wheat, uh, triticale, could be very poor. You know, at 40%, 45% digestibility, or what I what I jokingly call poor man's corn silage, which means you're going to be up in that 65% range. And of course, you control that based on soil quality, fertilization, maturity, time of cutting, those kinds of factors. So you control this curve. You control this curve based on the hybrids you're buying and how you're managing on the farm. This was also presented in that November Hordes webinar. And so the question uh, right now, tonight, you printed these off, how did you stack up? Uh, this is uh, from Dareland Labs. You can see 15,000 samples and you can see 2021 was a good year. If you look at uh, compared to other years there uh, we did you you growers did quite well with uh, average rfq 160 that's a great number that means that's dairy cow haylage out there so how do you stack up here comes corn silage same thing i don't have the numbers of samples in here but you can see uh, corn silage uh, traditional on the left and then the bmr on the right and there's no surprises there uh, these are good corn silages. You'll see starch contents up around that 35%. That's going to be a winner this year. You'll see just a bit later, if I can grow corn silage with 35% starch in, I may not have to buy or raise as much of that 750 corn. And you know, if you got some extra corn this year because of a great corn silage, we can sell that. You know, there's no law saying you cannot sell corn from a dairy farm that's raising beef cattle, dairy cattle, or hogs as far as that goes. So another nice benchmark. Notice the NDF digestibility at 30 hours. That is very traditional, uh, typical for the lower lignin corn silages. They just have more energy and more digestibility associated with them. Yes, I see that starch number. It is down two percentage points. So you could put this to our computer and probably discover that maybe those two kind of eliminate each other. In other words, a little bit less starch, but a little more NDF digestibility. They might uh, uh, literally pan out about the same. Number five, precision nutrient feeding. I think this is a future. You're seeing more articles in our popular press pop up on precision feeding of dairy cattle. Basically, our new rumen models allow us to fine tune these nutrients. Uh, it adjusts for uh, rates of passage, fill factors, digestibilities, dry matter intakes, uh, protein dynamics, starch dynamics. Uh, certainly, we want to make sure we have adequate levels of metabolizable protein which are coming from RUP, rumen undegraded protein, microbial sources. Uh, we could do a whole seminar on precision and nutrients as far as that goes. Grouping of cows will become more important, especially in our larger herd sizes and our smaller herd sizes. And those would be the magic six you'll see here in just a minute. And of course, here's the key. We wanna try to avoid excessive nutrients the cow doesn't need. This could be minerals, could be vitamins, could be feed additives, could be protected amino acids, could be lipids or fat materials. Now, we don't have time to go through this slide in depth because it would take five minutes. What I did is laid out for you in blue, and that is going to be the uh, uh, NRC 2001 in red, the new NRC. And this is for about the same size cow, slightly different here. These are coming right off of their models that they're running on. In, in, in those programs. And you can see dry matters in red, the good news, look at the close-up dry cows, love that number, love that number at this point. Uh, you can look at fresh cows and uh, that's, that, that's a big number, that's a big number. Milk is listed there, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and you can see uh, that certainly uh, the milk level associated with that. And that question comes up, what's the, what are the changes in RDP and RUP? Well, there they are. They're listed there for you. Notice that 10% on RDP goes right across the board 
And that is in the new book. It says that's kind of the optimal sweet spot for RDP, for microbial capture. And then the, re the residuals have to be made up with RUP. There's a crude protein listed for some of us who still use that number. I still use it. I look at it. And there's your MP, metabolizable protein. And again, you can see how those numbers have changed around just a little bit. I guess I'm a little surprised that the MP level is modestly low in the close-up group. I remember a lot of us are looking at 1,200 grams of metabolizable protein. And with 12 uh, kilo, uh, kilos of dry matter, uh, we're just not going to get there. Uh, you see some question marks there. I'm not quite sure why those numbers are there, especially in mid and late lactation cows. Not quite sure why that protein level and MP numbers would be that high. But of course, remember, dry matter has become a factor as well. Very busy table. Here's another busy one. And I know we're getting a, a little closer on time here, Abby. I'm watching that. But this is for carbohydrates. Now, notice I did not put the NRC 2021 in here because such things as NDF is gone, no longer used. Uh, excuse me, NDF is there, but they give you a range. For example, in early lactation cows from, uh, uh, say, uh, 18 to 27, big range, big ranges are 35. So, the, the, you know, that's the art. That's why you will pay a nutritionist consultant, someone on your farm, because they will fine tune that number. Notice starch, uh, that is coming off of uh, the NRC 2001, but notice it says adapted from, because it was not listed there. The new NRC does have starch values listed. Sugar, you can see, does not list there. And I think sugar becomes an important factor as well when you look at carbohydrates. So another very busy table that you can look at. Every one of you have this table, but the take home message for precision feeding, look how the numbers change as you go from far off to fresh to early to late lactation cows, huge numbers. What about mixing this TMR? Horse Dairyman does a market survey and Abby was kind enough to share the real recent one with us. We are right now in the US, we in, uh, have about 86% of our farmers feeding total mixed ration. You can see how that number has really changed over time. We have 8% of our farmers using robotic feed pushers and another 7% planning to buy in, or add to them in 2021. 2% of the farmers had robotic TMR mixer feeders, which means uh, the unit molds itself, mixes, goes to the barn and distributes the feed. Uh, really a European technology that is rapidly coming, uh, being looked at here by farmers. And then you might be curious on what the brands and mixers are. You can see our sponsors there at 25% at and that's how they broke out. Thought that might be of interest to you as well. Because precision meeting means you're going to have to do a precise job of getting a good uniform mix in these cows. You can see that the vertical mixers are the most popular at 40%. And then you can see how the rest of them break down going through here as well. And thought you might find that interesting knowing what, what type of mixers we're using here in the United States. Number six, and this one will be very short. I want to optimize room and fermentation. I, I mean, this is going to be a key factor. So we know that if I can get good room and fermentation, I can get a high yield of energy through VFAs and microbial protein. So as we already emphasized, we want to optimize the amount of a rumen degraded protein. That's 10%. Uh, we're well aware that about two thirds of the amino acids in an average or higher producing cow, not the various high producing cows, will come from bacterial sources. So that's, that's one of the strategies. Can I grow that uh, microbial protein, that metabolizable protein in the cow's rumen. We want to make sure we have starch to balance, to optimize dry matter intake and get adequate uh, VFA production. And as one author suggested, 70% of the energy that cows get, I've seen that number as high as 80% coming from carbohydrates. But then again, this is not a, a free lunch. It says that if you don't get it right, then you too can see signs of Sarah subacute rumen acidosis, and may require buffers and other strategies. So Abby, we have another, another survey question or a polling question. I'll let you uh, read it to our listeners. I will do that. Here's your chance. Uh, we have a little bit of a, a question here to challenge your knowledge. It says, which corn feed ingredient has the highest digestible energy content? The options are shelled corn, finely ground, high moisture shelled corn at 28% dry matter, hominy, 
or corn silage at 35% dry matter. So if you would pick one of those choices. We'll let the answers come in here for a moment and we can close the poll. And our answers here, Dr. Hutchins, 31% picked the shelled corn, 49% high moisture shell cor shelled corn, 8% hominy, and 12% corn silage. So look forward to hearing your well, thoughts. Well, Abby, those are, yeah, those are fascinating numbers. Let's answer the question right now. Uh, most of you got it, or the majority wins, but in an election, we'd have to run a, have a runoff. I thought you might find this interesting. This comes from the new NRC or Na, uh, NASM looking at digestible energy. And that is the term you'll find in the feed table. You will not find net energy values assigned because it depends on how the corn is used. And then I listed starch content. So as we come down here, you can see on this chart, uh, the, the, the starch that has the highest associated digestible energy is the high moisture corn at 28% dry matter. And, and listeners, that 28% is going to be important because we know that if it gets too dry, then it'll behave more like basically ground corn at this point. Uh, surprising, you can see that corn screenings uh, actually was uh, higher than cracked corn, and, and that is because it has more particle size at this point, but it doesn't beat the fine corn because you probably don't have quite as much starch particles associated with it there. And the starch content, you can see, is down just a little bit. So there are choices out here. And here are some other corn ingredients that uh, you can look at your leisure. Uh, I won't walk you down through them. A lot of our farmers are looking at hominy because it's uh, price competitive here in the Midwest, especially in Illinois where we have two plants that produce it. There's your corn silage. And there's another take home message for those of you that are coming into this year's uh, cropping season. You can see corn silage that's immature, typical and mature corn silages. And you can see how that adjustable energy changes uh, slightly. Uh, it always changes because as the plant matures, look to the right, yes, there is more starch there. You will have more starch in that corn silage, but you also have the plant maturing. So certainly that is where some of these uh, corn silage specific hybrids are going to win because they're going to have a more digestible energy source in the plant portion of the crop. So certainly there is your answer on corn silage, and that's why it did not win this one at this point. But look at the difference in starch, depending on how you grow and which hybrids you are going to be having on your farm. Number seven goes very quickly, got to reduce shrink. Uh, this is a big one though. This is a really big one. Um, several years ago, a colleague of mine said, the amount of dry matter losses can be six to 8%. And of course that cost can be, uh, and of course that cost is now higher because dry matter costs money. Remember. Dry matter costs money. And that's why you'll see the word optimal dry matter through feed efficiency rather than maximum dry matter. What kind of shrinks can we have? There they are listed. There's a much bigger list here. Uh, the, the good news is you'll probably see some of these shrinks. For example, uh, uh, mixing TMRs in New Mexico when there's always big 15 mile an hour winds, I'm sure some of that, those feed ingredients end up going to, going to uh, Kansas. Uh, then there's invisible shrink. And there is a group of listed ones there as well. And so certainly if you can find 45 to 60 cents a cow a day, huge number. And of course, now we have several in Illinois in which we have now built our mixing unit inside. So we have a, a, a feed mixing center and inside there, they bring the silages in there and therefore there are no birds, there is no rain, there is no wind. Nice environment for people to work in there. Uh, the mixer is down into a bit of a hollow, so therefore it's much easier to fill. Wow, it's a, a real a real interest at this point. You look at shrink and the question is, how would your chart look? This one comes from the UK actually, a colleague uh, that showed that at a webinar and he let me use it as long as I gave him credit for it, which I will. And what they did is they were doing a protein study. And they were looking at an 18, 16, or 14% protein study. And they looked at the variation. And they discovered very quickly that they had to reduce that, notice on the get to the right side, by testing the feeds and more frequently getting a good job. Now, is this because changing in feed, mixing pattern, uh, errors, and adding feed? I have no idea. But the question I would challenge you, what would your farm look like 
if you pulled, uh, did a TMR analysis every day for two weeks, that'll cost you some money, but what kind of variation in the TMR are your cows experiencing there as well? Pretty interesting table, so some really neat data. Number eight, feed bunk management. Opportunities abound here. How much space? We are now going at 30 inches feed bunk space for cows. Most of my cows are not 24 inches narrow. Waybacks. With our stronger milk prices, I'm suggesting two to 3%, even though feed is expensive. And in the fresh cow group and the close up group, I'm going to three to 5%. I want to make really sure those cows always have feed in front of them at this point. The next question is. <clears throat> How consistently are you at delivering those feeds? You go to beef feed lots, they say within 30 minutes. So if lot 16 is supposed to be fed at 8 a.m. in the morning, then the feed better be there at 8 a.m. in the morning, give or take 15 minutes. What about push ups? Uh, guidelines some farmers push up 24 hours a day. I question that. I think uh, the new recommendation is feeding, pushing up one hour before milking so those cows can consume that feed while they're waiting to go into the milking parlor and every two to four hours after milking. And ideally try to remove the way back from those cows every day. And that's important when you start looking at trying to um, control feed costs. Looking for signs for feed sorting. Uh, we're gonna be tight on time here, Abby, so I'm not gonna walk through that. Again, they, you can print that out, but these are all tricks of the trade. As you and I walk herds uh, and anything by, well, let's define long forage particles. I'm saying anything over an inch, anything over an inch, I would call a long sortable forage particle. And so there's other tricks of the trade listed there. You can look at that at your leisure as well. Another tool that some of our farms in California and New York, I do not have one in Illinois yet, and that is putting a camera into the barn itself so it can capture images of what's happening at the feed bunk there. And uh, this just shows you a picture of that person installing that camera. And here's the results. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, the company shared this with me. And you can see those areas in red are highlighted. There's no feed in those feed bunks. And you'll also notice there's no cows standing there. They're not, they're not very dumb. So the question is, you know, where is the feed available for those cows? And you can see on that top row up there, about a a third of the feed bunk is uh, two thirds of the feed bunk is empty. Uh, the bottom, the next one is about half empty at this point. Now, the question you and I want to ask well, why did it happen? Did the feeder not drop enough feed in those other areas? Is there a ventilation problem here? Is there a cow, um, a, a cow comfort issue? I don't know, but the answer is not making very efficient use of our feed bunks out here. Number nine. Strategic use of fats and feed additives. At one time, we were going to add amino acids, but we're just running out of time here. So here are going to be the listing. I'm not going to walk you through these. You probably have these. In fact, if you're really interested, go back to the archives of hordes, and we discussed these uh, in earlier uh, webinars a couple of years ago. Here are my six. So if I was consulting on your farm, I would show you the money that all six of these are really important for lactating cows. Next comes my close-up dry cows. You'll notice that buffers is gone primarily because of the decant situation. You'll notice I've got my organic chromium is sitting in there. I got my rumen protected choline in there. Yes, some of those are quite expensive, but I think you're looking at 21 days here and I'm gonna manage decant. You can do that uh, with, a, uh, with a binder or you can do that with a salt or with some of the commercial products to minimize and encouraging optimal blood calcium. Here comes my fresh cows. And again, you can see uh, uh, some of the same numbers, the same uh, same uh, supplements listed there. You got a sharp eye, you'll see we're looking at calcium supplementation. Uh, some of you need to be well aware of the new Cornell work that says uh, all cows have some low blood calcium, but those cows that are not healthy don't rebound in four days. And that was uh, the work out of Cornell University. Uh, keep an eye on that one. You'll be hearing more about that in the future. Uh, what about fat sources as we start wrapping up here? Well, oil seeds remain pretty competitive in my view, uh, as far as the fat or oil sources here. The inert fats have doubled in prices on, on the marketplace here. So this is a based on a research study in the Journal of Dairy Science that if you feed six tenths of a pound of an inert fat product, then it's gonna cost you about 37 cents 
the milk will cover uh, 54 cents rather milk will cover 37 cents of that so you've lost seven cents 17 cents unless cows don't lose much body weight or the cows have better fertility or we have less ketosis so those are all spin-off items as well out there in the program so here's our guidelines that we put out for soybeans raw or extruded two pounds per cow per day this is dry matter based roasted or cracked beans roasted and cracked four pounds not whole a fuzzy cotton seed five pounds per day and by the way you can mix and match these distillers grains a maximum of five pounds be well aware some distillers grains will have six percent oil some could have 14 percent oil and now the new computer programs the new models will calculate this for you we're saying less than 400 grams of polyunsaturated fatty acids that's your 18.2 18.3 fatty acids or two percent of the dry matter or rufus that's rumen unsaturated fatty acids so that's 18.1 18.2, 18.3, and a little bit of 16.1, and those are your guidelines, and now the models and your computer programs will calculate these numbers for you in terms of performance on cows. And number 10, as we start wrapping up here, is of course the transition feeding program, and uh, in fact, you will have a presentation on this next, next month. Uh, we are still looking at the two-group system at this stage of the game, modifying that close-up ration with some extra uh, metabolizable protein and starch, and of course, the fresh cow program to step up our cows from the close up to the high producing strain to smooth out that transition period. And those are some of the guidelines as well. So Abby, let's wrap up. Hopefully we've got a few questions to answer as we get going here. Uh, we have tools available, certainly to, to measure uh, uh, feed costs and feed efficiencies. You've got feed efficiency itself. You've got fecal starch. You've got current processing scores. You've got grain processing scores. Uh, out there, you got milk urea nitrogen uh, tools out here as well that can really allow us to ask how well do your cows understand uh, controlling feed costs. Number two, control the controllables. In other words, I can't control the price of energy. I can't control labor costs very well. I can't control veterinary costs, but I can control some of my feed costs on my farm, especially if I'm raising some of those feeds. And as one consultant said, this might be the year of being a feed grower rather than a feed buyer. Optimize milk yield and components. We're looking at good herds at seven pounds of fat and protein per cow per day. You are smoking right along if you're at that level here. And finally, finally, you may not be able to save your way into profits, simply meaning by feeding less feed, pulling stuff out of the diets, you may not be able to increase profitability but fine tune it, take a look and see where we're at. And so here's your answer key for those of you that are playing the game. Well, I'm not sure how many people got them all right, but those are the, the 10 big 10 universities uh, that were in the, the key that went through. So some of you may have played that game here and uh, uh, I, I guess Hordes Dairyman is gonna give you a prize. I have no idea what that prize is. Abby's very surprised about this, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it is kind of a fun thing to do at the same time as you're listening here today. With that, Abby, we'll turn it back to you to uh, uh, bring people up to speed and maybe answer some questions at the end. Thank you, Mike, for packing a lot of information into this webinar and for adding a little bit of fun on the way. We appreciate you working with us to put this presentation on today. Also want to thank Poon for sponsoring this webinar. We certainly thank them for their support of this program. To view this webinar again, or any of our previous webinars, you'll be able to find those on our website. Just go to hordes.com and look for the webinar tab. This webinar will be up later this week. And then again, all of our webinars from the past um, 11 years are available online. Um, we hope that you will make plans to join us again for a future webinar. You can see a few of our um, webinars that are coming up in the near future on May 9th. We will have a presentation by Dr. Jesse Goff from Iowa State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. He'll be talking about hypocalcemia and the transition cow. Our sponsor there will be Beringer Ingelheim. And then in June, we'll have a presentation on air quality and greenhouse gas emissions, a topic that's very um, timely in conversations right now, and our presenter will be Frank Mitliner from the University of California, Davis. That presentation will be sponsored by Feedworks USA. So please mark your calendar and look, um, look forward to some of those interesting presentations. Now we do have a question that came in ahead of time. So I will read that question to you, Mike, and then I'll remind the audience that if anyone else has questions, they can type them into the 
control panel, just go to that question section and type your question in. So first question here, Dr. Hutchins, came from Egypt. The weather, especially hot weather, affects feed production, um, where fiber, we can get fiber increases, protein decreases, and digestion, digestion decreases as well. What are some of your recommendations to deal with this situation to produce good feed in light of the high prices for concentrates we are seeing right now? Well, Abby, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, our, our colleague from Egypt was looking at forage quality here, and uh, the, the heat stress can really uh, impact the quality of that forage. Uh, some of the work, though, here in the U.S. would syndicate that if it is a forage quality, sometimes you will, you will really decrease the yield, but actually uh, the NDF digestibility might be actually improved a little bit. But if that's what he's facing with, then uh, obviously uh, if this forage quality is going to be lower in digestibility and higher in NDF and lignin content, then the answer is we're just going to have to dilute it out, uh, reduce down the level. So uh, I would encourage him to keep an eye on the UNDF levels in his diet and uh, adjust the amount of forage so he falls into that category. And the new NRC has got some really nice guidelines on that on the um, forage NDF numbers as you decrease that because you will then come in with maybe some of the byproduct feeds to increase more NDF digestible nutrients going into the feeding program. So it's, that's gonna be a tough situation. Either way, we're gonna see our feed costs going up if we cannot control that forage quality through timely cutting and harvesting procedures. Thank you for sharing those insights. Um, now we have some questions that came in from the audience and the list is growing, so I'll just start right now. How do we increase digestible, digestible NDF? Well, in, increasing digestible NDF is pretty much a feed, in my view, a feed ingredient uh, phenomenon. So basically it's going to mean that the NDF digestibility on forages is going to be related to if it's a grass or a legume and the stage of maturity. Uh, now, if it gets out of hand, you got a low quality forage and grass, and I think Rick Grant's data is just classic. We're going to shorten down the particle size so that it doesn't mess up my rate of passage or fill factors too severely out there in, 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 the, in the program. So uh, what we're going to do is, is to improve NDF digestibility. Certainly, we look at soy hulls, wheat mitts, corn gluten feed, uh, feed pulp. Those are all really good NDF digestible byproduct feeds. So what we can do, especially under heat stress situations, is swap them out. In other words, bring some of those into the feeding program. And also maybe bring those in, and especially if the price uh, price fairly effectively in late lactation cows. Uh, the classic work from Michigan State would suggest that uh, that's a great place to, to feed more forage and uh, byproduct feeds to take some of the starch out to try to control body weight changes in cows. All right. Um, what changes or benefits could be expected when feeding rumen protected choline? Well, I, th I think the rumen protected choline is being recommended because uh, and, and feeding it, we only have to feed it in the close up and fresh cow rations, uh, primarily to ensure uh, a better dry matter intake and better milk production. And I think the target, in my view, the target organ is the liver. To me, uh, we have a healthier liver at this point. And that liver does all kinds of important things in terms of producing uh, glucose from propionate, uh, from uh, producing uh, uh, blood urea nitrogen uh, to be sure that uh, we, we keep our, our numbers in there. So to me, it, the, the net effect is uh, it's going to be uh, dry matter intake and milk production, and that will cover your costs. Because and, and the other thing is this peak milk thing. <clears throat> if you look at the data from choline, you may only be feeding it for the transition period. But we're setting up the curve by about two kilograms all the way across the curve. So if you want to play that game and saying, well, if I get two kilograms every day for 330 days, and that's because of the impact it had in uh, 21 days prepartum and 21 days postpartum, wow, then the, the, the show me the money is, is pretty big. So that's where I think the room protected choline comes into play. Someone along the same line, someone's asking, where do you see a return on investment when using um, other rumen protected amino acids like methionine and lysine? Yeah, that's a, that's a really going to be a tough one because uh, first of all, they are, they are quite expensive, uh, typically in that one and a half, two cents per gram range. And so obviously when feed costs are already high, if I'm going to add a, another uh, 20 grams of lysine and 10 grams of methionine, you know, uh, as we say, the, the meter is running as far as that goes. Uh, 
the good news is that uh, here in the U.S., I'm going to be looking at some of my uh, blood meals to try to help me on the lysine side and some of my heat-treated soybean products to help me on the lysine side. The methionine, I think, is still there. And uh, the research that's been done at Wisconsin and Illinois here shows some fairly nice responses, not only as an amino acid for milk protein and milk fat, but it also improves immunity. It improves uh, the uh, fertility of cows as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the easy answer, Abby, is use your model, whichever one you're going to use. And if you're short on methionine and lysine, then you better bring them in. You better bring them in. And you have to decide if you're going to buy them as rumen protected or if you're going to try to uh, uh, look at a feed ingredient that may help you out a little bit. On the methionine side, I know co uh, the, the canola meal can help you out a little bit on the, on the methionine side, whereas the blood meal can help you out on the lysine side and some of the heat treated soy products. Staying on the same topic, someone would like to know, do you recommend feeding rumen protected choline over methionine in the fresh period? Oh, someone wants to get me in really big trouble, really big trouble as far as that goes. Um, <laughs> you can pass if you want No, nah, we're not going to pass. We just want to be uh, doing a soft shoe dance here so people can tell I'm, 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 I'm challenged here a little bit. The real question is, is, is the methionine coming in as a, as, as a methyl donor? And, and, that, and, and the methyl donor is what's going to mobilize some of that uh, uh, lipid material out of, out of, the, out of the, the liver as far as that goes. And the question is, you know, if I got methionine, can I, and that's another role for methionine, by the way, it is a, a methyl donor, which allows us to mobilize some of those phospholipids and get the job done. So uh, the, the answer is, uh, I, I will not stack that up. I, I, I just don't have enough experience. There are very few studies that have gone head to head where they have used the, the rumen uh, protecting the thionine versus the rumen protecting choline and have found that one is superior to the other. So I, I think they have, they have different roles. They have different roles out here. And so I, if I were doing it, I would, I would feed them a thionine based on what my computer is telling me and then I would feed the room protected choline in the transition period. That's my answer. Is it right? I won't bet the farm on it, but that's my answer. Thank you for that insight. Um, now we have a question. Can you comment on the proper order that ingredients should be loaded into a TMR mixer? Yeah, I, I can try that. I've, I've gone to a couple of different companies and they've given us their recipes and guidelines. Farmers have their own. By and large, if uh, my bias is if you're going to be putting in a long forage, be that baled hay or straw or, or grass like that, I'm going to pre-process that, uh, meaning that I'm going to put it through my mixer uh, sometime during the week when that mixer is available and bring it down to a proper size. One of our best dairymen here in Illinois, every Thursday he processes a straw and he brings it all down to an inch in size. And he knows and then his big uh, triple screw uh, unit takes about 24 minutes to do that. He knows that. He just knows that. Out it comes. And then he just treats that as another feed ingredient. But if you're cheating on me, you're not going to do that. Then I'm going to probably put that, that forage in there first and know how many minutes I need to beat that crop up uh, before I start adding in my, uh, my dry products, my grains, uh, my, my blends. Uh, that we have there on the farm. And then I'm going to come in with my uh, uh, haylages, uh, grass silages. Then I'm going to come in with my corn silage and or my wet ingredients. Wet ingredients would be like wet brewer's grain, wet corn gluten feed. Wet beet pulp would be another one in some parts of the, of, of the, of the world. It'd be available there. And, and then I would add the last, after that, I would add my water. If I'm adding water or, or a liquid supplement, I, I would add that last in the feeding program. And of course, uh, I think one of the real powers is uh, how uniform, how many minutes does it take to get the job done? And uh, basically, um, how many minutes does it take to load? Are you running it while you're loading? In some cases you have to because the tractor or the truck doesn't have enough power to make, to make it roll. And uh, uh, I think that's important. So. Uh, I, I know uh, when we've gone to several farms, I will actually time the time from the time he starts adding or she starts adding ingredients until it goes out to the barn to be delivered. And it was interesting because on this farm or these farms, uh, that, that time was just right there, very consistent, very consistent. So when they're mixing feed and delivering feed, they are just doing that. 
So that'd be kind of the order I would put them in. My guess, some of you consultants out there are gonna argue with me, but that's okay. Uh, you'll have a chance uh, someday to argue and win. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, next, someone was asking if the handouts of this presentation are available. And once again, yes, it is. If you go down to the handout section, you can click on that link and there'll be a PDF slide um, set there that you can print out also include some information about our sponsor for the month so feel free to print that out before the end of the webinar today um, mike we have a question here um, on one slide it had to do with the second poll question um, the the dry matter content of the high moisture corn was listed at 20 28 percent um, can you comment was is that any comments about that i guess is that correct yeah yeah, that, uh, Abby, that's a great, whoever has that question should get another prize from Horace Jeremy because it's a good one. Uh, the, the reason it's 28% and that's what it's listed in the uh, the NASM's uh, 2021. So that's the easy answer at this point. But I really want my listeners to be keenly aware that that 28% is important. If it gets down to 25, that's my trigger, then I'm going to treat it as dry corn, which means I'm going to go much, uh, I'm, I'm going to process it even finer as far as that goes. To get uh, to, to make sure that that start is going to be available for rumen microbes. And my guy, Lynn, I want about 70% of my starch fermented in the rumen to make VFAs and microbial protein. The other 30%, or should say 25%, is going to be done in the small intestine. And then I'm going to be hopefully having less than 3% end up in the total tract fecal starch analysis that can be done with labs. So that moisture is important. I would probably target nothing less than 28. I'd like to be around 28 or 30. To me, I think it's uh, to me, that's where I want to be. And we're going to be using our grain screens and uh, on using the, the number uh, four, that's uh, that's four uh, four squares to the inch. That's so it's a quarter inch screen for you uh, non-metric folks. Uh, uh, that's going to be, I think it'll be a 4,400 micron. Uh, I'm going to have about 75% of my corn on that screen. And the next screen down, which is the number eight screen, I'm going to have about 25%. And I'm not going to have very much fines or small particles with that with the high moisture corn there could be a little bit more there if you dried it because obviously with high moisture corn any of the dust will stick to the high moisture corn so i might be biased in my answers but we're going to process that especially when it's up at that uh, at, at that 28 to 30 percent uh, um, uh, moisture level if you get down below 25 then i'm going to pound it then i'm going to pound it just like you would pound uh, a dry corn good question all right, thank you for that for that explanation. Um, a question here: What is your opinion about the use of resi residual feed intake um, for dairy herds when you're talking about dairy rations? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I at first I was uh, not very excited about it, but now I am. Residual uh, dry matter intake, and it says if this cow was supposed to eat 50 pounds of dry matter a day, and now she's only eating 47, 48, but she's still giving me. Uh, 90 pounds of milk i'm a big fan she's my favorite cow in other words she is producing more milk per unit of dry matter out there in the program and of course now we are now using that uh, term uh michigan state is championing it uh and uh we are genetically able to select for that and yes the heritability is modest but certainly it's there and so to me what else can i really measure as far as that goes in terms of dry matter and of course that that all that data that's being collected pretty much is done by the various land grant universities because uh, you know it, it's not like uh, uh, calving uh, calving difficulties which you can run through dhia there you have to have the expected dry matter predicted off the equations versus how much of these dry matters are being consumed and then of course relate that to fat corrected milk or energy corrected milk so I'm, I'm a fan of residual feed intake as a dairy farmer i you you, you can't get the number. You cannot get that number. But you've got those cows out there. You will find cows that produce a lot of milk, and it appears they aren't spending as much time at the feed bunk or or what the case is. But I mean, you, you look on farms and you'll see cows that are out there, you know, that are producing 180 pounds of milk and another bunch of cows that are producing 100 pounds of milk and you wonder what's going on. And there's a different feed efficiency. There's a different feed efficiency tied up. All right, Mike, this question's a little a little different, but we'll see if you want to tackle it. Um, any, what are your recommendations for when you're trying to plan groups in the herd? You know, this person is saying this farm has two dry cow pens and then a single lactation group. So, you know, understanding that there are facility constraints on a lot of farms, but any thoughts on how you could maybe 
do some kind of grouping strategies that would benefit um, the feeding of the herd. Yeah, Abby, you really you really hit the nail on the head here, or the uh, the person submitting the question. Unfortunately, there are facility limitations. In other words, you cannot give me if you if you look at my 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 precision feeding table, there are the groups. There there are the there are the six groups I would like to have. If you're really high producing cows, you probably never have a low group. You probably just have a high group and then uh, uh, a mid a mid mid or late lactation group as far as that goes out out, out there in in the program. I do like the idea of the two close-up groups. I really am a big fan of fresh cow groups. I just think we can do so much uh, transitioning and monitoring cow health for that 10 days or 15 or 20, whatever those days are going to be out there as well. And so in a, in a perfect world, and I understand um, there could be a mixer capabilities also. In other words, a farmer's got 100 dry cows. I mean, he has 100 cows and, you know, 16 of them are dry. And then he's got two groups. That means he's got... Uh, in his close-up, he's got a pen of four. <laughs> You're going, how does my TMR mixer mix a group of pen of four? And, and so on some on some farms, if it's a mixer challenge, what I would recommend doing is to uh, go in and mix my dry cow ration and then run out X pounds to far off dry cows and then come back and spike it, spike the remainder with uh, my um, metabolizable protein source, the starch levels and stuff like that. And, and and do it there. And you could also do some of that on the farm, but the problem you already alluded to, and there just isn't physically the ability to split my lactating cows, and that may be related to the size of the farm or the milking part of the location, and cow movement pattern and, and lanes and stuff like that. That's a tough one. That's a tough one and you're kind of kind of stuck. But again, you know, if, if I had a, a, a low, a low if I had a, a, base, a base TMR, then I could always top that off for my my high group, but if you physically can get the high group in there, then you and I are stuck. Very good. And our last question here is actually a comment. It just says, "Thanks, Mike, for a great Thanks. webinar as usual." And I agree. And we always enjoy your presentations and all the information you share with us. So thank you, Dr. Hutchins, for joining us for the webinar today. Once again, I'll remind you that we do have our monthly webinars every second Monday of the month. They take place at noon central time. In May, we'll be talking about hypocalcemia and the transition cow. And then in June, we'll have a conversation about air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. So hopefully we'll see you on one of those presentations. Once again, I'd like to thank Kuhn for their sponsorship of this webinar. We certainly appreciate their support. And thank you, Dr. Hutchins, for the information you shared that could be put to use, um, good use by anyone who is feeding dairy cows. Also, I'd like to thank my teammates, Patty Kirchen and Michaela King for their work on the production side of these webinars. And last but not least, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. We hope that we are able to provide you information that's useful on your dairy farm or with the dairy farm clients that you work with. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Until next time, goodbye from all of us here at Hordes Dairyman, and we hope that you um, have a great rest of your month. Take care, please.